If you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to turn to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. We will get to Exodus, but Genesis chapter 15 is in essence the basis for everything that we are going to go through tonight. Genesis 15 is in essence the reason why you have the beginning part of Exodus that we've already gone through, the steps that have already taken place in Exodus, and now as we are approaching the Red Sea, the climax of them leaving Exodus before going to Sinai, that being the Red Sea, all of that is encompassed in Genesis 15, and all of it depends upon Genesis 15 and God's covenant with Abraham. In fact, when we first see God call Moses to go back to Egypt to bring out his people, we are told that the reason God is going to bring Israel out of Egypt is because of God's covenant with Abraham. Because of the promise that God gave Abraham here in Genesis 15. And so we're going to read through the chapter. I'm going to make a couple notes as we go through this. And then we're going to spend most of the rest of our time in Exodus. Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1, it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram and Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. Or quite literally, the one who comes from your loins shall be your heir. And he, that being God, brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven, and number the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And because of this promise that God has given to Abraham that he's going to multiply Abraham, he's going to make him a very great, and he's going to give him an offspring from his own loins through whom this great nation is going to come. And because Abraham believed the Lord, and by faith, Abraham, the faith that Abraham put in the Lord and his promises, God counted it to him as righteousness. Not by works, but by faith. And so then God says to him in verse 7, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am, how am I to know that I shall possess it? It's a rational question that Abraham asks here. It's not irrational, it's not illogical, and it's also not him asking in doubt, because just prior to this, God testified, as we have in his word, that Abraham believed God. So Abraham isn't asking this in doubt. He's asking this to know, how, how is this going to take place? And this is an important question, and the author of Hebrews picks up on this, because he, he says, by faith Abraham believed in the promises that God gave to him, but then the author of Hebrews goes on to say, but Abraham never actually obtained this promise. Because Abraham never possessed the land in the way that God said he would. Why? Because his offspring were to possess it in that way. And where we are right now in Exodus, Israel, the seeds of Abraham, up to this point, have not possessed the land as God promised. And so for God to fulfill his promise to Abraham that you and your seed will possess this land forever, God needs to bring his people back to the land to possess it. And so Abraham says, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And God said to him, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. They brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abr Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. And the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain 
that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking firepot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadamites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. So you have this event take place between God and Abram, where God cuts this covenant with Abram, and He does it in a peculiar way. And when God is cutting this covenant with Abraham, He causes this great sleep to fall upon Abram. And he gives him a message. He says, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs for 400 years. But after the fourth generation, that being after the 400 years, they will come back. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. We are in essence told here in Genesis 15 the events of Exodus that are going to take place. Israel is going to go into a land that is not theirs, and they're going to sojourn there for 400 years. We find out later that it's because of a famine that they end up there. And after a period of time, once Joseph dies, then they are enslaved and they are afflicted for those hundreds of years. We are told several other things. We are told that when they come out, they will come out with great possessions. But we're also told a number of subtle things that that Moses is drawing out here in Genesis as imagery that represents the Exodus event as well. We know that this entire event is linked with the Exodus because God directly links it but with prophecy. And so it shouldn't surprise us that there is more connected to it than just that. The covenant itself is a picture of the Exodus as well. You have these animals who are cut in half, and they're spread in a line, and what happens there is when you cut them in half and each half faces its pair, the blood runs down the middle. And then in a traditional covenant, the two parties who are making the covenant would walk through the animals to say, let me be like these animals if I break this covenant. But God is the only one who passes through. Abraham is asleep. Meaning God saying, this covenant is dependent upon myself. I have said that I will do this. I will do it. It's going to take place. And just as you have the two animals there and the path going through the middle, you have that same picture at the Red Sea. Likewise, you also have that picture with the smoking pots and the flaming torch passing through. Because what leads the Israelites as they leave Egypt, it's a pillar of cloud by day and a flame by night. Let's go back to, or go to, because we haven't been there yet tonight. We go to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. Where we last left off, we left off with the tenth plague. The Passover took place, and then you have the death, death of all the firstborn. And again, the firstborn is not a reference to children. It's not a reference to those under the age of adulthood. It's a reference to anybody who is born the firstborn, whether a child, whether a senior, among man or beast. And the death is so great that there is not one servant in all of Egypt, not one household in Egypt where somebody did not die. So tremendously great was the plague. But in Israel, no one died. Because the angel of death passed over because the blood was on the doorpost and the lintel. And so we arrive in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 33. It says, The Egyptians were urgent with the people. 
to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we shall all be dead. There's an interesting word that's used here when it says the Egyptians were urgent. Moses is using a, a pun. It's the same word for when Pharaoh hardened his heart. The point is that there's such panic over what had taken place that the response of the Egyptians was so strong to send them out that they translated it urgent because that best reflects it. But they're saying, get out of here. Because if you don't get out of here, at this very second, we will all die. We just saw all the firstborns die throughout all of Egypt, among the Egyptians, but not among the Israelites. And if we continue and we don't devote ourselves strongly to remove you from Egypt, we will all die. Verse 34, so the people took their dough before it was leavened and kneading bowls being bound up in their cloaks on their shoulders. The people of Israel had also done as Moses told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. Or as God said to Abraham, after the 400 years, when the people go out, they are going to be paid for the 400 years of labor. They will take payment from the Egyptians, the ones who oppressed them for all that time, and so when they leave, they will leave with a great amount of possessions. And God gives the people favor in the eyes of the Egyptians who just want to get them out of there before they all die. And so they give them everything that they ask for. The silver, the gold, the jewelry. And so they plunder the Egyptians and Israel leaves Egypt with great wealth. The people of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth. About 600,000 men on foot besides the women and children. And if you want to know the, the numbering of this, you can read the book of Numbers, which gives you the exact total of, of men but about 600,000 men is what they estimate probably around 2 to 3 million people total. Besides the women and children, that 600,000. 38, a mixed multitude went up with them. Meaning not just Israel left that day, but slaves from other nations that were in Egypt went up as well with Israel. And not just them, but very much livestock. And again, the very much is another word that is pun throughout the book to, be, to speak of the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, to, to, to say not only did Pharaoh try and glorify himself above God, God has humbled Egypt and Pharaoh to such a point that a lot of the glory of Egypt is now going with Israel. Very much livestock, both flocks and herds. And they baked unleavened cakes of dough that they had brought out of Egypt. For it was not leavened because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared any provisions for, them, for themselves. The time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. 430 years. And at the end of 430 years, on the approximate day, right? It says, on that very day, Day. What very day? The day that God said to Abraham in 400 years, after 400 years of oppression, I will bring your people out. And on that very day, meaning the day that God ordained when He passed through the animals Himself, when He cut the covenants with Abraham, that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It wasn't one day late, it wasn't one day early, it was on the very day. Now this has tremendous implications. As we continue through Scripture and we arrive at the New Testament and Jesus says, my hour has not come. My hour has not come. My hour has not come. My hour is now here. Father, glorify Yourself in the Son. As the Son has glorified You. Now my hour has come. The crucifixion happened on the exact day God ordained it. In the same way, the Passover. 
And Israel leaving Egypt happened on the exact day that God ordained it. It wasn't a day early. It wasn't a day late. It was on that very day. Verse 42, it was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So this same night is a night of watching kept to the Lord by all the people of Israel throughout their generations. Now just think about that for, for a few seconds. It's a night of watching by the Lord. This in essence summarizes the theme of the book when, or the title of the book, that being these are the names of the sons of Israel. And he lists the, the names of it. The fact that God sees His son, Israel, His people in bondage. He hears their misery. God is attached to them. Like a troop, they will come out. Gad. All the names are punned here within this phrase. It was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out. To say God has not forgotten any one of His children who are in Israel. They all went out in the same way that when Jesus says, I know my sheep and my sheep know Me, I lose none of my sheep. But they all come to Me. And I have more sheep. Not just of this fold, but of another fold. Speaking of the Gentiles. And I will bring them to Myself and they will be one flock, one shepherd. And in the same way that God brings Israel in their totality out of Egypt, so God will bring the church in their totality to Himself. Exodus teaches us much about what God does for us. Because God is a God of patterns. He does things again and again and again to show us, I'm faithful. I'm consistent. Just as I was faithful here in Egypt with Israel, so too I'm going to be faithful with you. I gave my promise to Abraham that 400 years they would be afflicted in Egypt, and after that 400 years, on the very day, I will bring out my people. And not only will I bring them out, but they will come out with tremendous wealth as payments for their labor for those 400 years. And as a remembrance, God institutes Passover. And as a remembrance of the crucifixion, God institutes communion. Jump down to chapter 13. In chapter 13 and verse 1, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both of man and beast, is mine. Why is this? Because God spared the firstborn of Israel in Egypt. He did not spare the firstborn of the Egyptians, but of Israel. And so God says, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. And later in Exodus, we're going to see that this is going to apply to the Levites that God has chosen them specifically because of their zeal for Him to serve in the role of priesthood. Verse 3, Then Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of slavery. For by a strong hand, or by a mighty hand, or by a hardened hand, it's the same word, for by a hard hand the Lord brought you out from this place. No leaven shall be eaten. In the month of Aviv you are going out. And when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, it sounds a lot like what He said to Abraham. After 400 years, they will go to the lands of all these people, which He swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey. You shall keep this service in this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen with you, and no leaven shall be seen with you in all your territory. You shall tell your son on that day. What God's saying is, it's not for you alone, but it's for every generation that comes after you. You shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And then their sons are supposed to say, it's because of what the Lord did for my father when he brought him out of Egypt. And then the grandchildren are supposed to say when he brought out our fathers. And so on, perpetually. The feast is a reminder of what God has done. Verse 9, And it shall be to you as a sign on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this statute. 
at its appointed time from year to year. And the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites as He swore to you and your fathers and shall give it to you. You shall set apart to the Lord all that first opens the womb. All the firstborn of your animals that are male shall be the Lord's. Every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Every firstborn of a man among your sons you shall redeem. But when in time, uh, but when in time, when in time to come, your son asks you, what does this mean? You shall say to him, by a hard hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. For when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of animals. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first opened the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. God's saying, it's not my intention to kill all my firstborn. They are to be set apart for my service in a special way. Verse 16, it shall be marked on your hand or frontlets between your eyes for a hard hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt. God did a mighty work and He calls His people to remember these things. And you have the the institution here of Passover and the institution of the Feast of Unleavened Bread for the seven days following. And so we get a glimpse here whether or not this was instruction that Moses gave them on the way or this is commentary that Moses is giving after. The chronology continues in verse 7 of their journey. They have left. In verse 17, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although it was near. Because God is smarter than us. We would think, go the shortest journey. Get there quick. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. That sentence there becomes pinnacle for understanding the events that take place throughout the Torah. Why does God make Israel wait over a year to get to the Promised Land? They journey to Sinai. They spend basically a year at Sinai. Then they celebrate the Passover again, and then they move on. And so you have close to a year and a half time by the time they send the spies into the Promised Land. Why? Because God is... going is going to give them test after test after test to say, be faithful. God is going to give them little things to be faithful in. You don't have water. Pray to me, I will give you water. I have told you, I am leading you to the land flowing of milk and honey. Do not think that I am unable to provide you water in the wilderness. All you need to do is ask. And yet the people rebel, as we'll see in Exodus 17. And so Moses strikes the rock and the water comes out. But all the people needed to do was have faith and trust God. And God gives them all these little tests because God knows if I go and I give them this big thing, I'm going to take you right to the Philistines and I'm going to tell you, wage war with all these nations and you'll be victorious. They're going to run right back to Egypt immediately. And so God gives them all these little tests lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. Or another way you could put it is God gives them grace and mercy for this period of time to grow. To prepare them so that when they get to the promised land, they can know that not only did God take care of them when He brought them out of Egypt, but God has taken care of them thus far. Or as we sang in Amazing Grace, by grace we're saved, and grace we have come this far. And by grace we will go home. Grace is through the entire process. And God in His wisdom Verse 18, led the people around the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. They're ready for war, but God's intent is not to bring them to war. Not at this time, not yet. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. For Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones with you from here. This is important. Joseph remembered the promise that God gave to his grandfather Abraham. That in the fourth generation, after 400 years, Joseph knew that Israel was going to leave Egypt and come back to the land. And he says, bring my bones with you. I don't want my bones to to remain as if I'm a sojourner in this land. Bring my bones home. 
And this is important because this should have been Israel's cry for 400 years. And yet, Scripture tells us of their rebellion in Egypt during those 400 years. To the point that I would argue when they're crying out and God hears in Exodus 2, they're not crying out to God, they're just crying out in agony. But God listens anyways and brings them out because the time of salvation has come. Joseph trusted in the promises of God. Verse 20, And they moved on from Succoth, and they camped at Etham, on the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them on along the way, and by night a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. And you have, as mentioned, a picture of this in Genesis 15, with the smoking, fiery pot as it passes through the animals, that covenant. And so they arrive at the Red Sea. Chapter 14, verse 1, The Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of P. Hararoth, between Migdol and the sea, in front of Baal Zephon. You shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land, and the wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Verse 4 here is in essence why God did what He did. In all of Egypt. Why He brought the plagues, why He hardened Pharaoh's heart, because He says, I will get glory. It's one, of, it's one of the two words that's used to speak of how Pharaoh hardened his heart. Or in essence, Pharaoh glorified himself in his heart over God. And God says, I will not allow this self-proclaimed God to have glory over me. And so I'm going to harden his heart once more so he pursues you thinking that he can take you back. But you are mine. And when he comes, I will destroy him and his hosts. Because I will have glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts. And all the rest of the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. And so what happens? Verse 5, When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants changed towards the people, and they said, What is this we have done, that we have let Israel go from serving us? How quickly we are to forget. Especially how quickly we are to forget when we are in the darkness. We're not in the light. It's not like the, all the firstborn just died. It's not like Israel, or it's not like Egypt is in ruins over these plagues. And yet, somehow, for some reason, they think, well, now what? We certainly can't do all this work ourselves to rebuild. We don't have any slaves anymore. So dawns on them, let's go get back our slaves. Why did we let them go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him. They took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them. All of Pharaoh's horses and chariots, and his horsemen, and his army, and overtook them, and camped at the sea, by P. Haroth, in front of Baal Zephon. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness. What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Not only are Pharaoh and his host quick to forget, so is Israel. Because they get to the Red Sea and they see Pharaoh marching upon them and their response is, would have been better to remain slaves in Egypt than to die here. 
And then later in Scripture, when, it's, when they're writing about this event, they speak of how this is a rebellion from Israel. Israel here at the Red Sea rebelled against God and rebelled against Moses. But God is patient and God is kind. In verse 13, And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. Meaning, God has cut a covenant with Abraham, which He promised to bring Abraham's descendants out of the land of Egypt. God alone passed through the animals, and so God says, I will bring my people out. And my people will have no hand in their own salvation. I will finish it completely myself. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. The Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Are they going to go forward? There is a great sea between them, and on the other side is Pharaoh. They're trapped. They can't go right, they can't go left. If they go backwards, they're dead or enslaved. And if they go forward, there's a sea. But God says, tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. That the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. This is creation language. This same sort of language is used in Genesis chapter 1. To speak of how God is all-powerful and God is powerful over creation. And and Moses writes Genesis 1 in, in such a way that he, he, when he writes Exodus, he draws imagery from it. Genesis 1, in verse 6, God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and morning the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place, and let dry land appear. As you see here in Exodus, God says, divide the water so that dry land may appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered, He called seas. And God saw that it was good. When they're standing at the Red Sea, their response shouldn't be, we're trapped, we're done for. Their response should be, the God who created the water and the dry land is able to move the water and let us through. Our God who created the water and then separated that water so some of the water's up in the air and some of it's on the ground, surely He's able to just lift up all this water so we can pass through. Or, our God who created this water is able to make us walk on the water to get through. The point is, the water is not a barrier for them because it's not a barrier for God. God is going to bring His people to salvation, to freedom, to the promised land. And so though there seems to be this immense obstacle in front of them, they should have faith. Because God is faithful to do what He promised to Abraham. And because God cut the covenant with Abraham and He alone passed through the animals, God is saying, this depends on me and me alone to do it. So Moses, lift up your staff. Stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry grounds. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they go in after them, and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of God who was going before the host of Israel moved and went behind them. Why? Because God is going to fight for you. You only have to be silent. Coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel, and there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. There are several occasions that we have with Abraham where Abraham pictures God the Father protecting his son, protecting his children, One of the most significant is with Isaac, when you have Abraham take Isaac up the mountain and offer him up 
Just as God is going to offer up His only begotten Son. But you have another one here in Genesis 15 that I didn't mention. Genesis 15, verse 10, And He brought him all these, being Abram brought God all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. It's parted. It's there. But there's also somebody else there. It says, When the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Or in essence, when the things that want to destroy the covenant from taking place come, Abraham drives them away. And Abraham pictures the father here. Is when the birds of prey come, that being Pharaoh and all of his army come to try and destroy Israel at the Red Sea, God Himself fights and He draws this barrier between them. Coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel and there was, a cl- and there was cloud and darkness like this great darkness that fell upon Abraham. And it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord drove, drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land. And the waters were divided. The people of Israel went in the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right and on their left. What a sight to see. Could you imagine going into the depths of the sea? I don't know if you've ever seen footage of scuba divers going down at the bottom of the sea. And when you're that low, the only light that you see is blue light up to a certain point. And once you get deeper and deeper, there's really no light at all from above because it just gets so dark. And can you imagine going down into the sea on dry ground in the depth where if you're at the bottom you were a scuba diver, it would be blue. Because all you see is that blue light. And if it was during the day, you're down at that bottom part, and all you see is great walls of water as two million people walk through. It'd be an amazing sight to see. It is miraculous because the God of creation who created everything out of nothing, surely He is able to part the sea to bring salvation to His people. Surely He is able to do whatever He desires to do. And the people of Israel, verse 22, went in the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them. Meaning, God now lifted the fire, lifted the cloud from blocking them. They've been blocking them for hours. So that they could not attack. But then Israel goes into the sea. And when they're in the midst of the sea, when they're in the midst of the grave is the picture that's there. Going down into a picture of death. They're as good as dead there because God lifts the cloud. He lifts the fire. And Egypt comes into the sea. The Egyptians pursued and went in after in the midst of the sea. All Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning watch, the Lord... And the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into panic. Clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. When it says God threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, It's not as some would argue and try and chalk this up to just, well, rough terrain on the chariots. And as they're going down into the the Red Sea, into the heart of it, it's going to be rough ground that's going to cause them to break apart. No. God is using personification language here. It's in essence, the, the wheels turned the wrong way. The wheels popped off. This was something that was supernatural to an extent that the Egyptians recognized this isn't normal. Something is wrong here. This is so abnormal that this must be their God fighting on behalf of them. And we're here in the midst of this sea. Walls on both sides. We need to get out of here. Because at any moment, we will all die. And they're not far off with their estimation. Verse 26, And the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. 
So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course. When the morning appeared, and as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. Meaning they're trying to get out, and God says no, and he throws them back right into the middle again. They're not going anywhere. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen of all the hosts of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. No one survived. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. What a sight it would be to see two million people walking through the sea with walls of water. What another sight it would be to see that water coming down and crushing an entire, an entire nation's army. Water isn't light. As in, water is quite dense. It's heavy. It has a lot of mass. If you pick up one of those 18.9-liter uh, jugs that you use in water coolers, those are heavy. Now, if I were to stand here, and you had somebody sitting there, and I were to throw that on them, do you think it would do some damage? Now, imagine walls of water wide enough that two million people can pass through it in one night. And then that all just fall on top of an army. There is no surviving that. Water is tremendously powerful. In fact, water might be the most powerful force on the planet. You can cut through inches thick steel with water. It's amazing. If you look at, at water jets when they, when they do CNC cutting, you can cut through a four-inch thick piece of steel with water at high pressure. It's a high-pressure stream that just goes and it just slices right through steel, and they cut out parts clean. You have parts that you use every day that are created that way. Now imagine millions and millions of gallons of water just come crushing down on an army. On an army that thinks that their leader is God. On an army that thinks that they have the right over Israel to make them their slaves. And God says, you can't even stand the weight of water. You have no glory. And so God says, I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen. How God is going to confuse them in the midst, in the center of the Red Sea, and then he's going to drop the water on them. He just lets the water return to its normal course. He holds it up by his divine hand, just as he sustains the universe. But when he says, no more, it all just comes crashing down. And then it's just them versus nature. And they do not survive, not one of them. And God says, you think that somehow you can have glory over me, the one who can separate the water, who can hold it there until I say, no more. Or as he says to Job, who are you? Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you when I said to the sea, you shall come this far and no further? And yet man somehow in his mind, puts himself as God and says, I will do whatever I want. And Pharaoh says, I am a God, and so I will do with your people whatever I want. But God is gracious, and because God cut a covenant with Abraham, and God based that covenant upon himself. Verse 30, thus the Lord saved Israel that day. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. They all washed up there. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians so the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in His servant Moses. 
what you have taking place here is salvation in a single day. God said at Passover, on this very day, the day you will go out. And when they get to the Red Sea, in one day, God brought about salvation. Because God is not a God that needs any sort of time to accomplish anything. God can accomplish whatever He wants in whatever time frame He wants. And God is not bound by time. One would not think that you would be able to destroy an entire nation in this way and bring such devastation to a nation this way and bring two million people out of slavery in this way in a single day. Now yes, there's a journey to the Red Sea, but when they're at the Red Sea and Egypt is here, they're as good as dead. They're at the point where it's either death or slavery. And the madness of the Egyptians at this point is likely more so along the lines of they're just going there and there's going to be a great slaughter and they'll just bring back whoever they can. And yet God brings about salvation in a single day. And when God wants to show His great power to bring about salvation through destruction, when God brings about salvation through His wrath, He'll often do these great events of salvation in a single day. Because no man can say, well, I did this. This isn't the only major event within the Old Testament. In Isaiah chapter 37, Sennacherib is encamped outside the walls of Jerusalem and he is about to enter Jerusalem to destroy it just as he has done with every other major city in Israel and Judah. He is on a conquest And he arrives at Jerusalem. And what does God say? Isaiah 37, verse 33, Thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into this city. Not only is he not going to come into the city, nor shoot an arrow there, or come before it with a shield, or cast up a siege mount against it. Not only is... Sennacherib not going to enter into Jerusalem. He's not even going to be able to fire an arrow at the city. He's not going to build up any sort of siege work. He's going to have no preparation to be able to get into the city. But instead, by the way that he came, he shall return. And he shall not come into the city, declares the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake. And for the sake of my servant David... Or, as we saw in Exodus, I am going to bring these people out of Egypt for my sake, because I will have glory over Pharaoh, and for the sake of my servant Abraham. So what does God do here in Isaiah? In 701 B.C.? Over 700 years later, after the Exodus, the angel of the Lord went down and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians in one night. And when the people arose early in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. Then Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and returned home and lived at Nineveh. And as he was worshipping the house of Nisroch, his god, Adramelech and Sharazel, Sharazer, his son, struck him down with the sword. And after they escaped into the land of Ararat, Esarhaddon, his son, reigned in his place. Oh, and God prophesied that that was going to happen to Sennacherib too earlier. It's not just the Exodus. It's not just this occasion here in Isaiah. But do you realize that your salvation came in a single day? In one day, God poured out His wrath upon His Son as an atonement for our sin. These themes of on a single day continue throughout the Old Testament because it's all pointing forward to Christ. It all points forward to Christ, to His death, His burial, and His resurrection. As we talked about briefly this morning, when Jesus appear to the disciples to remove their doubt, He first showed them through the Scriptures the things concerning Himself, the things concerning His death, burial, and resurrection. And what are some of the major events that this takes place? 
when Abraham takes his son up the mountain to offer him up, as the Lord said. God spared Isaac that day and gave the ram as a substitute, but God did not spare his only son. What are some other ones? The Exodus. You have Passover. Jesus is our Passover lamb. And so Israel leaves Egypt. They go down into the Red Sea and they come up, which is a picture of death and resurrection. You have this event in Isaiah. Where the angel of the Lord comes down and kills 185,000 Assyrians in a single night to bring salvation to His people. And the way that God is truly going to bring salvation to His people is through the pouring out of His wrath on His own Son in a single night. Jesus understood all this. In Luke chapter 22, they're celebrating the Passover feast and Jesus desires to celebrate this with them. And it says, When the hour came, He reclined at the table and the apostles with Him, and He said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And He took the cup, and when He had given thanks, He said, Take this, and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And He took the bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is My body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of Me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten saying, this cup is poured out for you. That This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. As it has been God-ordained. My hour has come. And in my last hours, I desire to partake of this meal together with you. The Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. We see in all these stories, these events that took place, really two sides. You have the side of life and the side of death. You have the side of salvation and the side of destruction. You have the side of grace and you have the side of wrath. You have the side of belief, and you have the side of unbelief. In Egypt, Israel goes out because of God's promise to them. And when they start to go through, it ends, Exodus 14, they believe the Lord and they believe Moses. But Pharaoh and his army, they didn't believe. They were just trying to get an end to their suffering as quickly as possible. And so they turned back on their word. Any chance that they got... And even after the death of all the firstborn, when Israel is roaming around the wilderness, they think, well, we made a mistake. Things are good now. The suffering has stopped. Let's go get them back because they've learned nothing, because they haven't repented, because they do not believe. And they continue to proclaim themselves as God. Sennacherib comes against Jerusalem. And God says, no, you will not destroy this city. I have used you as an instrument of my destruction, In Israel, I use you as an instrument of my destruction in parts of Judah, but I will not make a full end of my people. And so you cannot have Jerusalem. And when Sennacherib marches against Jerusalem in his arrogance, God wipes out 185,000 men in his army. Because he is one who has unbelief. But you know who has belief in that story? Hezekiah. Because Hezekiah calls to Isaiah to pray. He's not like the kings that come later that are wicked. They call on the prophet to say, well, what what, what can I do to avoid this destruction? Hezekiah calls Isaiah to pray. To seek the Lord for counsel. Because Hezekiah is a good and faithful king. Hezekiah is one who had faith. And even here, when you have 
this last hour, Jesus' final hour with the disciples, He earnestly desires to have it with them, and yet He says, but one of you, you don't believe. And when He says, for the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. It, God, it is God ordained that I will be delivered into the hands of the Gentiles and I will die for the sins of my people. For the sins of the world. That's been determined. But we are responsible for our own actions because, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And I believe there's a call here. And in every event of great salvation that we see in Scripture, because you have salvation and you have destruction on every single occasion, and there's that call to be one who believes and to not be the one who does not believe. Blessed is the one who has faith, but woe to the one who does not. Because the one who does not have faith will go to eternal destruction, but the one who believes will go to eternal life. God says, this is my promise. This is my covenant. And these are the stipulations of my covenant. If you enter into it by the blood of the Lamb, you are saved. If you enter into it by faith, you are saved. But if you do not have faith, you have not entered into this covenant. And so like Egypt, going into the Red Sea, do not, they do not come out on the other side because they are not part of the covenant. And Jesus here, He institutes the Lord's Supper and He says, this is My blood poured out for you. This is the new covenant. Enter it. Have faith. But one of you is going to betray Me and he does not have faith. And woe to him. Because he is one who will go to eternal destruction. And Jesus is gracious. His grace is offered to Judas. Judas could have repented like Peter did. And Peter denied him. But he did not. And so the call extends to us to be a people of faith. Because Israel, when they went on the wilderness, they were tested by God. God gave them opportunities to be faithful, and they rebelled. He gave them another opportunity, and they rebelled. So that when they got to the land where God had taken them on a detour to get there, they said, we can't do this. Let's go back to Egypt. And so God wiped out that entire generation, but he brought the second one in because they were faithful. And so the call of Exodus and the call of all of Scripture is to be one who has faith. God has proven Himself as faithful to what He has said He will do, both in salvation and in destruction. And we can have assurance of those things. And if we can have assurance of those things, then we had better make sure that we are ones of faith and not ones who do not believe. Let's pray. Lord, I thank You for the work that You did at the Red Sea, Your great example of salvation. Lord, You are a good and gracious God. That You made this covenant and You based it upon Yourself, Your own faithfulness to bring out Your people. And Lord, You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so, Lord, we can trust that when you say you are going away to prepare a place for us, but one day you will come again and bring us to yourself, and we will be with you forever, we can have assurance of that, because you have shown yourself faithful to do so time and time again through your word. Lord, let us not be a people who forget quickly. Lord, even, even though we have put our faith in you, even though we are saved, Lord, we, we still tend to forget. We still tend to be alert to the desires of the flesh. But Lord, let us not be that way. Lord, let us reject our sinful ways, our old self. For Lord, You have put the old self to death and have made us new, made us alive. And Lord, You have equipped us with Your Holy Spirit to be sanctified, to be transformed into Your image. And so, Lord, I pray that we would be obedient, that we would trust in You, even during the times that are very dark, 
that are troublesome, where it seems that you are far away, and though even when David said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He goes on to speak about how you are near to him. Lord, you are always near, always with us. And so, Lord, I pray that we would rest in that, knowing that you are working out all things for our good, for those that love you. It may not seem good by earthly means, but Lord, in the end, it is all for our good and for your glory. I pray that we would rest in that. In Jesus' name, amen.